My fiance and I are from California, but her family lives up in Colorado, and they own a cabin near Pikes Peak, way up in the mountains. After visiting them, they recommended that we go stay in the cabin a few days, and we are avid hikers, so we jumped at the opportunity. Colorado is very rich in Native American folk legend. Virtually every place you go used to belong to the indigenous community, and the few of them who remain keep the traditions and stories alive. Pike's Peak is no different. There are enough stories and gift shops to give anyone the sense that the land itself is alive. I don't know if that has anything to do with what is happening, but maybe someone here is from Colorado and can help us connect the dots. Faye and I are currently at the cabin. It's day four and we're planning on leaving today, but things have gotten very strange around here and it looks like we're going to be here for a while longer. We have enough food and water and the heater is in stellar order, but the Wi-Fi is terrible at best and there is virtually no cell reception. We feel isolated. I'll try to respond to the comments, but the internet dips out for hours at a time up here. The first weird thing that happened was the snow. There was no snow in the forecast, so we packed light, but on first night here, just our luck, a blizzard pounded the whole area. My little Corolla is basically a brick on ice outside, and there's no way I'm going to make the six-mile drive down the mountain to town. I blame myself for trusting Colorado in spring. After a day, Thursday, of lovely hiking and sightseeing, some really unsettling stuff started happening. When we returned to the cabin just before dark, we found an enormous deer catcher dangling from a tree about a dozen yards from the back door. This wasn't the kind of thing you're imagining, the kind you buy from a novelty shop. The thing was made from twigs and twine, and it's about three feet in diameter, absolutely humongous. Neither Faye nor I were stupid enough to touch it. We're veteran horror movie fans. We know that's how you get cursed. If the snow melts a bit, I'll get back out there and snap a picture of it and post it here. That night while we were eating dinner, we heard a bunch of noises in the woods outside. Twigs crunching, leaves rustling, etc. This isn't unusual because we saw some elk and deer on our hike, but the sounds were slow and purposeful. They stopped and started and were rhythmic, like someone was casing the area in a crescent shape around the cabin. I used my really bright tactical flashlight to look outside from the porch, but there was nothing. We stayed in all day on Friday, and just cuddled, hung out, and played some of the board games that we brought and some of the Super Nintendo games they had in the cabin. Donkey Kong Country 2, and I have considered stealing, because it's the greatest game ever made. It snowed again, and after dark, we started hearing more noises. Around 1am, Faye woke me up and told me she was hearing a voice outside. I strained to listen, and thought I could make out the sound of a man crying very far away, but his voice was drowned out by the wind, so I wasn't absolutely certain of what I'd heard. We went back to sleep, but again around 4.45, we heard him more distinctly and closer. He sounded like he was calling for help, but he would dip into another language that I've never heard before. We called the ranger station at the bottom of the hill using my cell phone, and they told us that they'd get up there and check it out. We never saw them, and I doubt they ever came. On Saturday, shit got really scary. It snowed again in the morning, and I stopped getting service for most of the day. Faye and I watched movies and tried to Skype with her family, but that didn't work. She went to sleep early, around 8, while I did some photo editing on my laptop in the living room. She woke up crying hysterically. When I asked her what was wrong, she said she'd had a dream that she was lost in the woods outside and something was following her. I cuddled with her until she fell back asleep, and eventually I drifted off too. Faye woke me up at around 1am. She was absolutely beside herself, and I've never seen her so afraid in my life, and just the look on her face really unsettled me. She told me that she'd heard the man outside again, but she recognized the voice. She was absolutely convinced that it was her grandfather's voice, and he was wandering around outside begging for help. Faye's grandpa died when we were seniors in college four years ago. I told her that she was dreaming, but... Then I heard the voice too. I never met the guy, so I wouldn't recognize his voice, but it did sound different from the one last night. It sounded older. I had to do everything I could to keep her from running off into the woods looking for him. 
Eventually, she realized that the possibility of it being him was absurd, so we put on a movie at a good volume and fell back asleep. My cell phone wouldn't connect a single call. What happened last night, Sunday, was the thing that has sent me over the edge. Essentially, the same thing happened around 1 a.m., at which point I was still awake, almost expecting the noise to happen. I heard a voice. This time, it was a woman's. Thankfully, it was distant enough that it didn't wake Faye. I walked into the bathroom and cracked the window open just a tiny bit. The frosty air that came through the cracks seemed like a death sentence to me as a Californian. Nobody could survive outside for that long. Not without serious military-grade winter gear. And yet, someone was wandering the fuck around out there, snapping on twigs and crying. I'm a reasonable skeptic, sometimes arrogant agnostic, but I'm telling you, the voice sounded exactly like my mother's. My mom is alive and well and living in Southern California, so my brain instantly cramped at the sound of her voice out there in the Rocky Mountains. I would know my mother's voice anywhere. I think we all would. And I'm telling you, I'm about 90% sure it was hers, which was way, way too sure to not scare the shit out of me. I grabbed my light and went outside with a blanket wrapped around me and my hiking boots on. I circled the entire cabin and looked around. There was snow pushed out of the way in a big meandering pattern that snaked in and out of the tree line like someone was drunkenly shuffling around. Maybe they were injured. The path went right to the bathroom window and then back into the woods. Each time the voice called out, I shouted, Mom? Who's there? Who are you? And each time the voice receded further into the woods. I'm pretty sure it was trying to coax me deeper and deeper into the woods, away from the cabin. I'm still alive because I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to die like some dumbass in a bad horror movie. I went back inside and made sure that we were locked down tight, since I can't call the ranger station. I'm posting this instead. I'll keep you updated. Edit. It's Monday. We ought to hold a phase dad. The weather is supposed to clear up tomorrow, so he's going to come pick us up in his truck and help get my car back down the mountain. I'll keep you all informed. Only one more night in this place. I'll try to get some photos up. Edit. 9 p.m. Monday. I've been able to get online twice today. I wish I knew more about electronics, but I'm a history teacher. <laughs> so I don't think I can fix the Wi-Fi or predict when it'll work. I can send and receive email messages on some Reddit posts, but I cannot load some websites or view photos. Faye hasn't been feeling well since noon. She developed a stomachache and has been intermittently throwing up. We both ate the same thing, and I feel fine, so I'm not sure what it is. She sometimes gets like this when she gets worked up. Although I'm agnostic slash atheist, she is very Catholic and is pretty convinced that something supernatural is going on. No need for alarm at the moment. She doesn't have a fever, and I'm keeping her hydrated and in high spirits. She seems to be on the mend. Went to sleep around an hour or half ago. Some noises to report. There's cackling, repetitive vocalizations in the forest. It's probably a hundred yards out. The tree line starts about twenty yards out, so, so this sound is coming from much deeper. Some movement spotted just beyond the tree line at dusk, but it could be elk, deer. Couldn't see very much. Keeping all the curtains closed, windows locked, furniture in front of the front and back door. I'm checking on Faye every half hour. Her dad will be here in the late morning to pick us up and dig my car out. Another Redditor near us pointed out that I'm an idiot for not double-checking the weather. Yeah, you're correct. I promise I'll provide an update as a new post tomorrow, should anything significant happen. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Um, <sighs> Faye's dad picked us up in his truck. He brought his buddy with him, who's now following us in my car. A lot of things happened last night. Some things I won't share because I'm not sure how to interpret them yet. I'm not even sure I understand what happened. But here are the most important things. I also managed to get some recordings. I tried to stay awake last night until 1 a.m. because over the past few nights, that's the approximate time that the noises changed from rustling and branches cracking to voices. I didn't make it. I fell asleep on the couch with my laptop open, waiting for the Wi-Fi to come back. I think this was about 12.30 a.m. I woke up around 1.15 a.m. to a muffled voice. In my sleepy days, I struggled to figure out where it was coming from. 
I thought it was just outside the living room window, so I sat there quietly trying to make the words out. It was a woman's voice and said things like, A few days. It's not mine. I'm not alone. I got up and peeked out the curtain. I didn't see anyone. But then the voice said, Okay. And I knew the voice was Faye's. As I mentioned earlier, my fiancé has an undiagnosed sleep disorder and has extensive sleep talk, sometimes sleepwalks. She has had pronounced night terrors since she was a little kid. I'll post a story about that someday. I walked into the bedroom to find Faye sleeping on her stomach as usual. She didn't say anything else as I came in. Two things really disturbed me about this situation, though. The first is that she appeared to be having a conversation with someone, which is actually quite common for her, but the person she was conversing with was interrogating her, asking her questions about herself, me, the cabin, etc. Second, in her sleep, Faye was imitating another voice. It wasn't hers that she was speaking with, she was alternating pitch and tone to sound like a different person. My modus operandi is to not wake her up when she has sleep disturbances. There's a story behind this. Expect one someday. Instead, I gently rub her back in hair, which calms her and puts her back to a restful sleep. I did this for a few minutes, but then there was another voice, off in the distance outside. I got up and walked to the window to listen. I think this was the first time that I really felt scared enough that I felt like we were in real danger. It was a child, singing in the dark. We couldn't really make out what she and he was saying, but I am certain that it was a child. It was probably six or eight, trying to sing a song. The snow had abated for a while now, and the stars were notably bright. So I could see all the way to the rim of the forest, it was about twenty yards out. There was a figure standing there just past the first trees, back facing me, looking up at either the moon or the tops of the trees. It stood so still that I convinced myself that it was a tree stump or something. In a few minutes, it was no longer visible. My skeptical nature compels me to be reasonable and say my eyes were playing tricks on me. When I turned around, Faye was sitting straight up in bed, eyes closed. She does this a lot in her sleep. She craned her neck and said something like, Don't let them in. Or, Don't let them inside. She was still doing the weird voice, so I woke her up. Faye and I sat in the bedroom with the lights on, talking about what we should do. I tried to get online to send an email to her parents, but of course it doesn't work when you need it. We agreed to stay in the same room and try to fall back asleep. At one point, I got up to get her some water. She hadn't vomited in several hours and she was feeling better. And out of the kitchen window, I saw flashes of pale light. They weren't like the flashes you'd see when someone walks through the woods with a flashlight. They were more like if someone had a lantern, they could slowly turn on and off. I flicked on the porch lights to the front side of the house, hoping that it would discourage anyone from trying to approach, but as I walked back to the bedroom, I saw the distinct outline of a person through the window curtain in the living room. They were pressed against the glass with their hands on it, trying to peer inside. Since it was dark in the living room and bright outside, I could clearly see their silhouette. I shouted and approached the window, but the person ran off before I could pull the curtain open. Faye slept soundly, but I continued to hear voices outside, different ones on and off all night until dawn. I wrote several of them down. I couldn't sleep, so I camped out in the living room. I kept the bedroom door open so I could hear Faye if she started talking again. The voices would go away for hours and start back up again. At one point, I fell asleep, but I was awoken by the sound of a light switch flickering on and off. From the couch, I could see the light from outside going on and off in patterns of five. I couldn't explain why this disturbed me so much, but it did, and I imagined some kind of horrible creature standing in my house somewhere, flipping the switch up and down, smiling. My first instinct was to go check on Faye, and I nearly had a heart attack when I saw that she wasn't in bed. I started calling her name and pacing around the house, looking out the windows to see if she was outside. When I looked out of the kitchen window, there she was, sitting on the hood of my car about 30 feet out in the driveway. Her back was to me. She was staring off into the forest. She, she was absolutely rigid, just the same way she sits up in bed when she's asleep. Faye has sleepwalked all over the house back in California. I found her in the kitchen and downstairs hallway in the living room, but she's never gone outside. I shouted her name from the kitchen, but the second I did, Faye jumped off of my car and dashed into the woods at full sprint. She never looked back at me. 
I started flipping out and screamed her name over and over again. I screamed to grab my boots to go after her, but the second I pulled the front door open, Faye called out my name from behind. She was standing in the hall, looking confused and asking me what was wrong. Apparently she had been in the bathroom. In, in my masculine crusade, I guess I'd forgotten to check there. I looked out at my car and into the forest, and honestly, the first thought that came to my mind was, you clever motherfucker. Needless to say, we stayed up the remaining few hours until dawn, intermittently writing down the voices we heard, which faded away and became less frequent with the passage of time. Here's the list of voices we heard. I will return to Colorado, but fuck Pike's Peak. Man's voice. Vaguely familiar, but couldn't put a face to it over the past several nights. Hello? Hello? Oh, God! Look at it! Hello? Hello? Uh, a woman's voice. It sounds... It's... By the way, I forgot to check to see if that dreamcatcher was still there out back. You're welcome to drive out there and look for yourself, though. So that night, we sat down with Faye's mom, Laura, in her bedroom while her dad was watching the news downstairs. Her mom was so upset at the stories we told her, I mean, she was visibly disturbed to the point of being in tears. She kept apologizing to Faye and hugging her. Laura told us that they'd purchased that cabin from their good friend Jennifer, I think, who moved to Nevada about 20 years ago, and her husband had complained about all sorts of weird experiences while living there. Her husband, Tom, like myself, was fond of hiking and exploring the woods, and collected tons of arrowheads and other neat trinkets he'd found in his travels around Pike's Peak. But Jennifer started having dreams about Tom being dragged into the woods from their bedroom, she had all sorts of horrific nightmares about him being skinned and pinned up to trees like some kind of macabre artwork. Jennifer said that while Tom was at work, she would occasionally hear the voice of her daughter, who had died in childhood due to some kind of bone cancer, calling Mommy from the edge of the forest. Jennifer's doctor claimed it was the medication she was on and changed her meds. Tom got a new job in Vegas, and they basically noped out of there. And on a lighter note, Tom hanged himself in the garage two years after they moved. No note or anything. Anyway, uh, Laura, Faye's mom, and Greg, Faye's dad, only used the cabin as a getaway in the summers. Laura never experienced anything beyond weird feelings while she was there, and she chalked that up to all the crazy stories Jennifer had told her. Greg, however, who suffers from PTSD, related... Greg, however who suffers from PTSD-related nightmares and occasionally experienced exacerbated sleep disturbances in the cabin. Over the years, he became reluctant to go there and claimed that all the things he'd seen in Vietnam came back to him when he slept there. Allegedly, some of the people he killed would come back and talk to him in his dreams at the cabin. The last time he stayed there, he woke up in a dream to find a few of them sitting in his bedroom with him, maimed, rotted, and he privately maintained to Laura that he also heard their voices in the forest, crying and begging and screaming for their mothers. Oh, and guess what time he always heard them. Laura told us that she honestly didn't believe there was anything wrong with the cabin. Faye was extremely pissed and let her have it. They kind of ended our visit on a bad note. Later that night, I was up reading, and Faye was asleep next to me. She always falls asleep before me. That girl could fall asleep on a pile of rocks. She started mumbling in her sleep, so I listened carefully. 
Never. Never, never. No, I wouldn't. On the mountain. Can't. What? His name? We don't know you. No, it's Felix. My name. About two hours later, she woke me up by nudging me in her sleep and saying, Tell the man in the hall to leave. This set me over the edge. So I got up to go to the bathroom and get some water. I didn't find anything strange. I had a very hard time falling asleep, though. This morning, we heard back from the guy who went up to the cabin to check for gas leaks and carbon monoxide, at the behest of a few scrupulous Redditors. The guy mentioned that radon is a really big problem in some of these old places in the mountains. He's some kind of super badass handyman with all kinds of equipment, so he wrangled up one of the peak rangers and they went into the place together. Apparently, there were tracks all around the house. A dozen pairs of them, like a large group of people, had wandered around looking in windows. All the windows and doors were sealed the way we left them. When they got inside, some stuff was moved around and the silverware drawer was emptied onto the kitchen floor and turned upside down. The power was completely dead. The weirdest thing was that there was water all over the bed and on the floor, but our guy checked for leaks in the ceiling and bathroom pipes. Nothing. Nothing had been stolen from the house. Not even food. Some old clothes in the bedroom closet were strewn out across the ground, but nothing stolen. Like, maybe someone was trying them on or smelling them? The ranger said that there were legends about the mountains. Something about things that sort of act like people, but they come out of the old abandoned mines. Greg's friend couldn't remember the name the ranger gave them. It was a native language. I asked Greg to ask the ranger about the sounds I heard, specifically the Wachu, Wachu, Wool, and he said it's a widely recognizable chant, but he doesn't know what it means. Does anyone here have any idea? No radon, no carbon monoxide, no gas. The place is all electric. He checked for mold and said it was unlikely that there would be any all the way up there. He did say it's possible that there's some kind of electrical problem and that this can sometimes cause people to feel unsettled and maybe have hallucinations. He has some kind of Geiger counter or gadget that detects issues like this, but it was broken when he tried to use it. I'm going to keep a close eye on Faye. She's still shaken up about all of this. And if there's anything left to report, I'll let you know. Update 421 2016. We have begun hearing voices outside of our home. Faye is really upset and feels like I might have exacerbated the strange circumstances by giving them widespread exposure online. I'm going to go dark for a few days and see if that helps. Don't worry about us. We have a few close friends looking out for us. They know the entire story. Hey everyone, I just wanted to make a quick update, as promised because Faye and I are flying back to California shortly. Faye is back to normal, is feeling great. I watched her eat a huge plate of chicken parmesan yesterday. The first thing I should mention is that Faye's father was very reluctant to talk about the cabin or the weird experiences we'd had there. He kept trying to change the subject and was generally in a bad mood, which is pretty normal for him. He's a really grumpy Vietnam vet and has been in the army since he was young. His personality is exactly the way you'd imagine it. Faye asked him bluntly, if something is wrong with that cabin, why would you let us go up there in the first place? And his response was, talk to your mother. Faye and I flew back from Colorado on Wednesday afternoon. She slept the entire time, despite the noise, which amazed me. I can't sleep on planes because I'm absolutely terrified of flying. I'd rather stay another night in that cabin. When we got home, I ordered pizza and she wolfed it down. Her appetite has returned in full force, which is great news. I mentioned this in my original post, but Faye has an undiagnosed sleep disorder. She has pronounced night terrors and sleep talking, and the occasional sleepwalking. This disorder lies dormant 90% of the time, but it tends to flare up when she's under a lot of stress. If we're moving, if she changes jobs, or if a relative dies, I can expect a night of horrifying talking and odd behavior. Needless to say, our experiences at the cabin have set Faye on edge. Although she's in high spirits, she's still afraid at night. I am too. That night after pizza, she fell asleep on the couch while we watched Wedding Crashers. At around 10pm, the movie ended, and I turned the TV off. 
As I brought our plates to the kitchen, I passed the stairwell and heard a faint noise from upstairs that sounded like a man sighing. I shrugged it off and woke Faye up. We brushed our teeth and went to bed. Faye talked in her sleep a lot that night, and it started around 1 a.m. I woke up to her calling out. What did you do? And... Do you need any help? (laughs) And laughing. This isn't really unusual for her. She babbled occasionally, said a few funny things. I woke up again around 4 a.m. and heard her talking, but this time she was doing something she'd never done before. We've been together for almost five years, and not once has she ever whispered in her sleep. But now she was whispering with her back turned to me. For a second, I thought somebody was lying on the floor at the edge of our bed, talking back to her. This disturbed the shit out of me, so I sat up and leaned over her, trying to listen in the dark. The only thing I heard was her discernibly say, I asked her, Faye, what are you talking about? She didn't respond. I said, who are you talking to? And she replied, don't, and nudged me. Another unusual thing happened around 5.45 a.m. I woke up to Faye getting back in bed. She hurried into the bedroom from the hall and got back in bed quickly, making zero attempt not to wake me. First of all, Faye doesn't get up, ever. She sleeps like a dead horse, and even if she went to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which she never does, the bathroom is not down the hall. It's in our bedroom. When I asked her what she was doing the next morning, she claimed to have no memory of it. I spent all day Thursday thinking about why Faye was still acting weird. I was the one who found the dreamcatcher and got close to it. And I was the one who interacted with the voices at the cabin. Then I remembered something. On our last night in Colorado at her parents' house, Faye got back into bed around the same time 5.45 a.m. I barely remembered because I was half asleep, but the image returned to my head. She'd been getting up really, really early for a few days. So last night, I set my phone's alarm to vibrate, and I put the time to 4.45 a.m. In the middle of the night, Faye started talking again. This time, she was doing the same thing she did at the cabin, changing her voice to sound like someone else. In five years, she sleep-talked a bunch, but she never whispered or changed her voice until recently. She said a few things, which I tried to commit to memory. La, la, la. (sighs) Followed by a day on, or tay all, over and over. He's still in the trees. Where were you? I looked for you. And, ooh, it's time. About the same time, I heard a noise outside, which sounded like an old man grumbling to himself about something. We live in NorCal, in a really woodsy town. So when you look out our bedroom window, there's a ton of trees across the street. It was very dark, but I'm fairly certain I saw a man walking behind the first line of trees. He was too far away to be the one grumbling, but it's still very unusual to see anyone over there this time of night. In fact, I've never seen anyone over there at night, ever. Looking outside required me to open the curtains, which lit up our bedroom with moonlight. When I looked back at the bed, Faye was lying with her neck craned towards me, her eyes crazy wide and fixed on me, her mouth was open. She issued this really, really frightening, gurgly, drawn-out groan and flicked her tongue. And flicked her tongue around. It looked like a, it looked like an epileptic fit in slow motion. Faye had definitely opened her eyes in her sleep, but never like this. She looked like a fucking murderer. I got so scared, I called her name really loud and woke her up. She was confused and asked me why I was at the window. I lied and said I was just closing it because it was cold. I didn't want her to know I'd heard a voice. We talked a bit, but I'll skip that because this is getting long. My alarm woke me up at around 4.45am and I laid there awake, waiting for Faye to get up like she'd been the past few nights. She breathes very rhythmically when she's asleep, so I can tell how deep she's under. At around 5.20, she sat straight up, swung her legs out of the bed, and tiptoed down the hall. I followed behind. And when I say that my fiancé tiptoed, I mean like a child on Christmas Eve. This was very robotic, alien, inhuman. She moved like a meth-addicted ballerina zombie down the hall and stopped at the stairwell. Her breathing never changed. I just stood there in our bedroom, poking my head out into the dark hall. Faye looked down the stairs, still standing rigidly on the balls of her feet, swaying to and fro slightly. 
She did some weird shit. She, she touched her face slowly for several minutes, touched the banister, touched the wall, flicked the lights on and off a few times, all the while maintaining her perfectly regular coma breathing. Then she reached an arm out like in the... Then she reached an arm out like in the motion of a bicep curl, stretching her fingers and wiggling them, then curling them, her hand and her arm back up to her face. I watched her do this motion for about four minutes. It, it looked like she was testing the limb as if she'd never used it before, but then I realized she was actually communicating with someone on the first floor of the house. She was making a come here motion. With full confidence that with full confidence that Faye was sleepwalking, I walked into the hall and leaned over the half wall that overlooks the living room. It was totally dark down there. I couldn't see anything but the clock on the cable box. Faye stood there waving, smiling, making gestures, and then touching her face and pulling gently on her hair. I carefully ushered her back to bed and talked to her softly, trying not to actually wake her. She didn't resist, she never does, and we went back to sleep without another word. I have zero clue what the fuck is going on. I told her this morning what she did, and now we have a doctor's appointment for her at 3 p.m. today. I took Faye to see her doctor yesterday, and we hesitantly explained what was going on with her. I left out the paranormal stuff because I didn't want to get put in a ward. She seemed really concerned about Faye and ordered a blood test, gave her a physical, asked her about her diet and drugs, medicine, etc. Faye and I are both non-drinkers, non-drug users. Neither of us are on medication. She wants Faye to be evaluated by a psychiatrist next week. For now, she gave her a sedative at night and some anti-anxiety medication. She wants us to get some fresh air and get out of the house, so we're going on a hike today. A Redditor brought up the possibility that the child's voice outside the cabin asking when do we go inside, when do we go inside, might not refer to inside the cabin, but rather inside Faye. This really worries me, because it corroborates some of the strange behavior she's been exhibiting in her sleep. I contacted the park ranger, who is pretty sympathetic to our situation, and he's going to get in touch with some of the members of his tribe who have experience with spiritual guidance and medicine. He is convinced that Faye and I have attracted the attention of the ones who come out of the mines. Lucky us. More on that later. Some Redditors have recommended that I test Faye to see if it's really her. So yesterday evening, against my wallet's advice, I took her to our favorite steakhouse. I only ever order one meal there, medium tri-tip, house macaroni and cheese, and a bottle of root beer. Faye only ever orders one meal there too, the barbecue chicken sandwich with mac and cheese and a salad with ranch dressing, and a Coke. She drinks Coke only. Her blood is mostly Coca-Cola. Faye took a long time to decide what to order, and ended up ordering a fucking New York strip. I jokingly told her to order for me too, and she said, I don't know what you want. She also ordered water instead of Coke. Usually we have arguments over how much Coke she drinks, and I'm always trying to get her to hydrate better and just drink water. This was really unsettling to me. At the end of the night, when we were walking back to my car, I kissed her temple and asked if she still liked it when I called her Noodle. She said, Of course. I've never called her Noodle in my entire life. Her nickname has always been Monkey Toes. It's a long story. When we got home, she cracked open a Coke and got on Facebook, which is completely normal for her. This threw me off. One thing that's been on my mind lately is the song the little kid was singing outside of the cabin. I've been catching myself humming it almost every day. I asked Faye if it meant anything to her, and I sang it to her while she was sitting on the couch. After a few repetitions, she sort of went blank, like she was hypnotized, and just wobbled back and forth ever so slightly for about eight seconds, and then snapped out of it and said, I don't remember that. Last night is when shit hit the fan. I haven't gotten a full night's rest in over a week now, and it's starting to make me feel over-emotional and crazy. Faye started murmuring in her sleep around one, as usual, but I couldn't understand much of it. She sat up in bed, took the sheets off of her legs like she was going to get up, but I grabbed her arm and asked her what she was doing. She said, Tell them to leave. Her eyes were completely shut. I asked her, Who? Who needs to leave? She sat there for about two minutes, not speaking, just sitting straight up. I asked again, and she replied, There's a man at the door. Then about ten seconds later, And a woman at the bottom of the stairs. 
Of course, this made every single hair on my entire body bristle. I got up and went downstairs, turning on every single light as I went and carrying my buck knife with me. Nobody was in our house. I looked in every single room downstairs and even in the backyard. When I got back to the stairwell, I heard someone stomping around upstairs. Someone had turned the lights to the upstairs hallway off. I stood at the bottom of the stairs looking up, trying to listen, but the noises stopped. So I walked back up into our bedroom and got into bed. It was likely that Faye had gotten up to go to the bathroom or sleepwalked a bit in the room and went back to bed. I fell asleep pretty fast, but woke again only a few minutes later. Faye was gone. I heard movement down the hall, so I looked out into it, and I saw Faye coming out of the other bedroom. She staggered down the hall toward me, and then stopped, and turned around, and walked back in the other direction. She did this seven or eight times. She was walking in almost the same way as the night before, standing really high up on her toes, her legs totally rigid like they were made of cement, and her arms completely limp, flopping back and forth. It was extremely fucking terrifying seeing her move like that. She was totally graceless. It was like someone was testing out a human body for the first time. At that same moment, I heard a noise through the bedroom window and ran over to check, thinking someone really was at the front door. You can see down to the front entryway from my bedroom window. Off in the distance, about 30 yards out, somebody was walking back and forth in the same exact way that Faye was. He was humming loudly and intermittently singing. The song sounded like the one I sang to Faye earlier, the one the child sang outside the cabin. I ran back into the hall and woke Faye up and brought her downstairs. I opened the front door to get a better look at the man, but he was gone. Today, at the behest of a few Redditors, I asked Faye if she'd ever been to that cabin before we visited. I don't know why I never thought to ask her this before. She said nothing about it when we stayed there for several nights. She was hesitant to answer me and eventually admitted that she'd been there once when she was 14. She and her parents went snowshoeing up in the mountain. A few hours later, I emailed her mother and asked the same question. She told me that Faye had gone to the cabin multiple times as a child, but stopped going when she went to high school. I can't figure out which one of them is lying to me. Because so many people have questions about Faye, she has agreed to do a filmed interview. If you post questions for her, I will film her responses and post them back here within a few days. I haven't told Faye this, but I'm thinking of going back to the cabin and meeting with the ranger. He wants to do some ritual with the Dreamcatcher we found, if it's still there and he says that he will bring his friends and try to cleanse the house in the surrounding area. This will cost me like $500 just to fly out there, but if this shit gets any worse, it might be worth it. Edit. A Redditor sent me a private message telling me to investigate the guest room to see if Faye was doing anything in there. It turns out she was. She had written the number five on the window with her finger. I only saw it because of the condensation from the cold this afternoon. It's written backwards so that someone standing in our backyard can read it. I cannot tell you how much all of your support has meant to us over the past few days. Faye feels so good knowing that people are constantly asking about her health, and I feel like a few of your suggestions have literally saved her life. So thank you, from the bottom of my heart. I don't even know where to begin. So much has happened in the last two and a half days. The sedatives and anti-anxiety meds the doctor gave to Faye work during the day, and she has been less stressed. However, at night, her behavior is still highly unusual. I have taken the overwhelming consensus of Redditors seriously. I went out and purchased a bunch of child-proofing materials for the house to prevent Faye from harming herself or going outside while sleepwalking. I couldn't afford a bunch of cameras, sorry, I'm a teacher. I bought these knob covers that little kids, and hopefully sleepwalkers, are too stupid to figure out. Outlet covers in case she tries to jam anything into them, and I hid the kitchen knives. I also brought in a spiritual healer after very carefully searching for one. It is my opinion that 99% of them are frauds and hucksters, but this woman did not charge us anything, and she was recommended by close family. She is the daughter of the Shoshone tribe leader. The long and short of it is, she believes our house is not haunted. However, she says that Faye feels very off. She said she couldn't get a good read on her at all, and that there is a dark cloud over her. Still suspicious of this woman, I took her to a random upstairs window and told her that I had seen someone outside near the edge of the woods, mimicking Faye's sleepwalking, which was true, but I pointed out the wrong window, to the wrong part of the forest. She quietly examined the other windows upstairs and said that our bedroom window, the correct one, gave her a terrible feeling. She said, 
He watches from here. She can hear him whispering at night. We told her everything. She was horrified by our story. The look on her face unsettled me so much. It was like she never heard of anything this bad. She went out of the room and had to collect herself downstairs. The woman prayed for several minutes, sang a beautiful song in a language I can't even begin to describe, and saged our entire house. She put some kind of crushed herbs on the ground in front of the two doors that led into our home. Then she told me in private, You were dealing with the hollow ones. She said its name in her ancestral language, but I cannot even come close to remembering how to spell it or say it. She said that one is infatuated with Fay and will do absolutely anything to get inside our house, but the process takes time. I don't know if I actually buy any of this, but at least she didn't sell it to me. <laughs> We also had Faye take a pregnancy test, as recommended by many Redditors. The woman said it was a good idea. Good news, not pregnant. And the woman stood in the bathroom with her like a prison guard so she couldn't fuck with the test. We thanked the woman, and she left. That night, we attached a little jingle bell from Faye's Christmas-themed lingerie to a hair scrunchie and put it around her ankle. I'm such a light sleeper that there's no way she'd be able to get out of bed without waking me. Faye fell asleep really fast due to the meds, out like a light in a few minutes. I lay in bed, thinking about the five that she wrote on the window in her sleep a few nights earlier, and reasoned that it meant 5 a.m. and not five days, as some Redditors had speculated. This makes sense because she's been getting up at that time to sleepwalk every night for four nights in a row. Since the five was written backwards, facing the backyard, I reasoned that it was a signal to whoever, whatever was out there, she was going to try to let it inside. Eventually I fell asleep, and I had a fucking horrifying dream. Something came into the house, through the sliding glass door to the yard, walked up the stairs and into our bedroom. It sat at the edge of our bed, rubbing Faye's foot and staring at us. It was completely wraithed in shadow, and I couldn't see it at all except for a silhouette. I woke up, soaked in sweat, and I couldn't fall back asleep for a while. 5 a.m. rolled around, and the reliable little jingle bell woke me right up. In her sleep, Faye did something that she's never done before. She stood up on the bed, rigid as a board, and stared out the window. I shouldn't really say stared because her eyes were closed, but she was alert, watching and listening. She remained there like a statue for at least five minutes. I also didn't move, I just watched. Then she slowly raised her hand and started waving at someone outside. My skin crawled when she did that. She definitely knew someone was there, even with her eyes shut. Faye then stepped off the bed and darted to the bedroom door, trying to get out into the hallway, but the childproof knob cover stopped her. She couldn't figure it out in her sleep. She did another thing that she's never done while sleepwalking. She got extremely angry and started pulling on the cover. She shrieked and growled like a trapped animal. After 30 seconds of this, she woke herself up and started crying really hard and told me that in her nightmares, she had seen a man without a face walking through the halls of our home, whispering her name and looking for her. I sat up and talked with her for an hour, and then we went back to sleep. It was around 10 a.m., April 24th, and Faye was gone. The bedroom window was open. As I walked downstairs, I saw her in the backyard, reading. Every single window in the entire house was open. It was like 55 degrees outside. She told me the smell of sage made her nauseous, and she wanted to get out of the house. I couldn't smell anything. I suggested that we go to the church downtown today to speak with a priest. She's Catholic, but she refused. So I had my buddy Kay, who is a very, very devout Catholic, come over with some holy water and his crucifix. Apparently Kay told his priest what was going on, and the guy very reluctantly blessed the water and told us to call him. Faye was irritated that I had done this without her permission and waited outside while Kay set up a few little crosses and his big crucifix around the house. Faye refused to have any holy water put on her. She kept saying, I'm freezing, don't you dare. She is going to be super pissed when she finds out I put that shit in her shampoo and conditioner bottles. She was in a really nasty mood all morning. But after we went out for lunch, she was feeling better and agreed to film the interview and answer questions from Redditors. While filming, I noticed that she wasn't wearing her engagement ring and realized that she hadn't been wearing it in several days. I asked her where it was, and she said it was in her luggage, which we've now partially unpacked. Later, when I checked, it wasn't there. I'm worried about this for a few reasons. I'll post the video as soon as she watches and approves it. She's self-conscious. Expect it in a few days. 
and I've finally begun moving some more of the photos from the cabin onto my laptop too. I cannot bring myself to listen to those voice recordings yet. Flash forward to last night. I got up at about 1am to pee, and I knocked the bell scrunchie off the bed. Faye had taken it off and was gone. I got angry and scared at the same time. I found her sitting on the stairs, looking down into the dark, spreading her arms open like she was trying to get a child to climb up the staircase for its first time. She was smiling with her eyes closed. As I usually do, I gently got her up and walked her back to bed. When I laid down next to her, she leaned over, with her eyes still closed, and said, They're gonna kill you. And then licked my face. I called her parents today to arrange a flight back to Colorado. They were paying for it. Her mom, Laura, admitted to me that something had happened to Faye as a child at the cabin. That is where her sleep disturbances started when she was five. I've had enough, and they can tell. They spoke with the ranger at Pike's Peak again, and he's arranging for me to meet with him and his buddies from their tribe, who knows the entire history of the area, and all of the hauntings that other visitors have reported. Faye will be staying with my two best friends, R and J, and J's fiancé, A. I've known all three of them since high school, and they're completely informed about all these events, and they will guard her with their lives. In short, I'm going back to the cabin, alone. I'll update soon, but no matter what happens, I'm not going to drag this out any further. Edit. Folks, I won't be at the cabin alone. I'm meeting the ranger and his friends there. His two friends are from his tribe, nation, sorry, I don't know the correct terminology, and they are healers. They know all about Pike's Peak and the ongoing situation. I'm not going out easy. Update. I dropped Faye off at my friend's place. They'll take care of her. Heading to the airport now... No idea when I'll get back on. I'll try tonight if I'm not too tired after landing. Update. 426. Midnight. Colorado. I met Faye's parents. Exhausted. Talked to her parents extensively. Got word from my friends. Faye started feeling really ill. Wanted to go home. They moved the whole posse over to our house, which has been saged, blessed, protected, and covered in holy water and crucifixes. And she is allegedly doing much better. Richard and Jason, and Jason's fiancée, Allison, are all sleeping over for a few nights to ensure Faye is alright. Heading to the cabin tomorrow morning to meet the ranger. Update. Um, so, 4, 27, 9.45 a.m., Colorado. Leaving in one hour to go to the cabin. Oh, no wait, sorry, I said it was the 27th, uh, it's the 26th. Update. 4, 26, 5.15 p.m. Spotty bullshit Wi-Fi! Snowing like crazy up here. Met with the ranger, investigated the cabin, nothing unusual inside except a lampshade removed from a lamp, which he claims was not like that when he came in there a few days ago. His friend will be here tomorrow morning. I'm alone for tonight. I went outside for just a minute when it was still light to grab some things from the truck. I heard two voices. Update. 4.27. 9.12pm. So much has gone down. I'm so terrified and sleep deprived. I'm writing a huge post about it now with everything that's happened. I'll post it tomorrow morning because I know I can't finish it tonight. I'm going to fall asleep in my chair. Sorry to keep you waiting. It's been an interesting few days. I have so much to say, so I'm going to try to be terse. Sorry that it's taken so long to report. I really am trying. All of your questions and analysis of these events have really helped us through the struggle. Some of your observations are what brought me back here to Colorado. I landed in Denver International Airport two nights ago and stayed with Faye's parents in Arvada. While there, we all sat down and I basically forced them to tell me what was going on. A Redditor pointed out that Laura, Faye's mom, appeared to be lying or hiding something. Another Redditor asked me if Faye had ever been to the cabin before, since her family owned it for almost three decades. I never even thought about this. When I asked Faye, she said no and that her parents just used it as a getaway a few times a year. Faye's mom told me that she'd been there multiple times when she was little. This time, Faye's parents told me a different story. They claimed this was the truth. Faye had been to the cabin as a toddler a few times, and when she was five, something happened to her. While Greg, Faye's dad, and Faye were outside playing in the snow, Faye wandered off towards the edge of the forest to look in. She was following a voice. Greg was building a snowman and keeping his eye on her, they were only a few dozen yards apart. Allegedly, Greg heard Faye talking, answering questions, but he couldn't hear anyone else talking. 
He started walking toward her to bring her back, and he heard her say, Faye. No, it's Faye. I can't see you. A moment later, little Faye began shrieking and crying, and she went stiff as a board, and Greg had to pick her up and haul her back inside. She was almost catatonic and would go through bouts of total silence or, or inconsolable hysterics for several hours until Greg and Laura decided to go back down the mountain and take her to a hospital. Greg claims he never saw anyone in the woods and never heard any voices speaking to Faye. The doctors thought that she may have had an epileptic seizure, and to this day, Faye does not remember ever going to the cabin. When I took her, she acted like she'd never seen it before. I believe that if Faye did remember being traumatized as a child, she'd never want to go back. So I really think she blocked out the whole experience, and when we visited a week ago, she thought it was her first time going. In Laura and Greg's subsequent visits to the cabin without Faye, Greg experienced terrible nightmares in which dead people entered the bedroom and sat on the ground in bed, watching him sleep. In the morning, Greg let me borrow his truck. He refused to go to the cabin with me. He told me when I left, we let you kids go up there because we honestly wanted to believe that there was nothing actually wrong with that place. They used us to validate their denial. But I don't hold them responsible. I'd never have believed any of this if I were them. Dreams and a frightened child do not a haunting make. I arrived in Pikes Peak around 1 p.m. yesterday, and the ranger met me at the cabin. We investigated the place and didn't find anything unusual, except that a single lampshade had been removed from one of the lamps and placed on the couch. We checked out the nearby woods. I was kind of surprised to discover that the creepy, ominous dream catcher was still there. The ranger told me that he did not recognize it, and it was not something that his people made. He told me not to mess with it until his friends showed up. He told me he'd return with them in the morning and left. That night, some shit happened. Greg told me that he'd hidden a 357 Magnum in the closet, so I retrieved it and a really dope-ass purple bathrobe, and I felt a little better. Don't worry, I know how to shoot and how to keep it safe. Right around sunset, I walked out to Greg's truck to grab a few things I'd neglected to bring in earlier, and I heard two distinct voices chattering in the woods. It was snowing like crazy and the wind was howling, but above the storm I heard a gruff masculine voice and a younger adolescent male voice. They were both yammering, incomprehensible gibberish from two different places. I hurried back inside and locked the door. The stuff they were saying was pure madness. It made no sense. Put them up. Up there in the trees. Ah, oh, take, take. Walk on down there. Go ahead. Put them up. I just sat there, imagining psychotic cannibals jabbering with their tongues hanging out and eyes rolled back in their skulls. I figured they'd come out of the woods as soon as it was dark. I tried to reach out to Faye back home, but my phone wouldn't get any reception in the cabin. The storm was too strong. I tried to play video games on the SNES, but I was too distracted by all of the sounds outside. Every single noise the blizzard produced caught my ear, and so my imagination manifested all kinds of horrible creatures slinking around out there in the dark. When I finally went to bed, the wind died down a bit, and I heard a few more voices. There was a distinct, high-pitched wail that echoed across the entire mountain. There was a child crying, saying something like, Put me down in the but his voice sort of glitched. It, it would suddenly become deeper, as though a grown man were doing an impression of a little kid. I also heard someone hacking and vomiting and crying, begging for help. I didn't fall for any of it. I'm 28 years old, and this is the most afraid I've ever been in my entire life. Even with Faye walking around like a fleshy marionette and calling out to a presence in the dark of my own home, Around the time I was getting into bed, approximately 12.45 a.m., there was a gentle tapping sound on the window in the living room. It was soft, like a neighbor who was reluctant to bother me. I stood there in the bedroom with the door open, holding my breath, trying to figure out if I'd imagined it. Then I heard it again, so I crept down the short hall and peeked around the corner, just in time to see a figure walking past the windows and toward the front door. With the curtains drawn, I couldn't make out anything but a big shadow. Then it knocked on the door. It was a gentle knock. A man's voice called out softly. Hello? I just listened intently and tried to keep silent. Eventually he knocked again and said, Hello? I... I need to speak with you. He was speaking through clenched teeth. He was either extremely cold or extremely angry. I very carefully stepped back into the bedroom to grab the gun, but the goddamn place is so old the doors creaked. 
I barely tapped the bedroom door as I passed it and it squealed like a dying pig. Then the man outside said, just above a whisper, I know you're there. For just a moment, in my lethargy, I considered the possibility that it was one of the ranger's friends, or maybe someone else who lived on the mountain. I was never going to open the door, but stupidly, I figured talking to it couldn't hurt. I say it because I immediately stopped believing that there was a human being on the other side of the door the moment I opened my mouth. I said, Who the fuck is it? As assertively as I could. The second I stopped talking, whoever was out there repeated my question while mimicking my voice accurately. It almost sounded like an echo, and then he said, May I come in, please? His voice sounded a little shaky, but it definitely sounded like me, unnervingly similar to me. But he was still clenching his teeth, so I could hear the difference. I pointed the gun at the door. It was dark in the house, so he couldn't see what I was doing through the curtain, and said, If you don't get the fuck out of here right now, I will blow you in half. For those of you who don't know what a 357 can do to a person, a slug to the chest essentially makes you into a human milkshake. And that's after passing through two inches of oak door. We both just stood there for a dreadfully long time. It started testing out my voice, groaning and whispering and muttering. It said a lot of things, but I only remember a few of them. What's your name? What's your name? A little cabin for the weekend, for the weekend, for... And then a bunch of lip smacking and chewing noises. They're lying. They're lying. The ones out there. <laughs> You're not alone in there. And I'm not alone out here. What's your name? You go up in the trees down in the hole. That's where you go. Oh, they'll find you either way. The sound of my own voice making these horrific noises and phrases set every inch of my skin on fire. I can hardly describe the physical sensation of fright this intense. It was almost like having a bad fever, hot and cold and wet and sticky all at the same time. I shouted for it to leave and said I was armed. I considered firing off a round, but that's a decision you can't take back. And my number one rule is to only fire when I'm certain I've got a target and a clear reason. I'm proud to say that I can use my voice a lot better than whatever it was that mimicked me. I'm a soft-spoken guy, but I came down like a fucking hurricane, screaming, I will fucking kill you! He replied simply, in a softer tone of my own voice. I will fucking kill you! Then it went back to babbling gibberish and knocking politely on the door over and over and over. Another minute or two, it suddenly stopped. The last thing it said was, I know where she is. Then it kicked the door, and I mean harder than any human could have possibly kicked a door, and ran off. The boom was so loud, I couldn't believe the door didn't implode on its frame. The person thing bounded down the wooden patio and off into the snow. And I swear on my life and honor, it sounded like a, a horse or some other huge four-legged animal charging off into the woods. A child's laughter rang out. Then everything was silent. Needless to say, I remained in a cat-like state of delirious paranoia for the rest of the night. The storm picked back up, and I did not hear anything else. I spent the whole night debating whether the thing at the door was talking about Faye. I tried to convince myself that it was just yammering more nonsense like all the voices I've heard up here, but the way it spoke that sentence haunts me even as I record this. Its voice, <laughs> my voice, was purposeful and restrained. It chose the words carefully, and it knew exactly what to say. I've been thinking a lot about what Redditors have been saying about Faye being some kind of doppelganger. When I first saw the nude woman on my car, I thought it was a trick to lure me into the woods, where the voices lie. I thought the real Faye stopped me from leaving the cabin, but many of you have pointed out that the reverse could be entirely possible, given how the Faye I took home to California is behaving, given how she has failed all of my tests, and given her engagement ring has been missing since we got home. So I sat there for hours considering whether I should go out into the woods during broad daylight to search for my fiancé. Of course this is a stupid idea, but now I understand why people in horror movies do idiotic things. If I'm not looking for her, or for answers, why am I here? I need to know what I saw that day in the driveway, I need to know if there are many voices or just one, and, and I need to know how to get all of this back to normal. 
I listened to music on my iPod and desperately tried to distract myself by reading news articles online until daybreak. Most of them wouldn't load because the gods of internet have cursed this cabin. Around 4am, I got up to get some food from the kitchen, and I opened the window curtain a tiny bit to see if anything was going on outside. A ton of snow had fallen. At the rim of the forest, dozens of yards out, I could see a distinct figure standing perfectly still in the moonlight. He was facing away from me, staring off into the darkness of the woods. I checked on him every 20 minutes since then. He never moved. When the sun rose around 6.15am, he was gone, and I never saw his face. Today, the ranger and his two buddies came to the cabin, as promised. They were instantly likable and warm. One of them, Tiway, is a medicine man in his 60s, and was especially cool. The other was his son, Nathan, who was probably just a few years older than me. They told me all kinds of interesting lore about Pike's Peak and the surrounding areas, and then proceeded to tell me a disturbing story that they believe explains the strange activity on the mountain. For the sake of brevity, I will relay this in my next post. The ranger gave me one of his facility's satellite phones to stay in contact with him in case of emergencies. I used it to call Faye, but she didn't answer, so I called Jason and Richard, who are presently caring for her. Apparently, Faye had become inexplicably outraged after taking a shower, threw an enormous tantrum, and locked herself in our bedroom. She refused to eat for the rest of the night. Allison and Jason slept in the guest room, and Richard slept on our couch downstairs, and worked late on his commissions. He's a digital artist. He told me that around 1am, the same time I had my visitor, Faye ran downstairs into the kitchen, eyes closed and started drinking out of the sink faucet. She then turned around and stared eyes still shut, at Richard while he sat at the breakfast table. She said, Felix. To which he replied, He's in Colorado, Faye, remember? And then she said, We sent him there to die. Then she sat down right there on the kitchen tiles and went back to sleep. I've instructed my friends only to wake Faye if she does anything serious, so they observed my rules and got her back into bed without much of an issue. For all the crazy shit Faye does when she's asleep, at least she never gets violent. The guys put her back into bed easily enough. The next day, Allison bailed on the whole project. She said she was awake all night, listening to Faye whispering through the walls. Faye told Allison about how there was a man in the house, and he was asking about her. My flight home is the day after tomorrow, so I'm going to have to figure all this shit out real quick. I'm going to take a nap. It's nice and bright outside. No voices. Good night. P.S. As soon as I get home, I will put up the Faye video. I know I keep saying this, but I really did not expect to suddenly return to Colorado. I swear, I'll put it up, and then that will be the end of it. I resent myself for turning this into such a long, ridiculous blog of my experiences. Tiway is an incredible storyteller. He told me that Pikes Peak and the surrounding area was inhabited by the Ute, Manitou, Arapaho, Pueblo, Anasazi, and other Native American groups at various times. In the 1860s, when the gold rush was in full swing, many Indians were violently displaced because of mining operations there. They were torn away from their sacred lands, which was catastrophic to their cultures. Tiway stressed that historically, Americans have not understood the significance of land and names to Native Americans, and this is critical to understanding the supernatural presence on the mountain. The major world religions like Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam are universal. They can be practiced anywhere. You can pick up your whole life and move to Kentucky or Scotland or Istanbul, and you'll still be whatever religion you are. Your God still hears your prayers, and he still intervenes in your life. But Native Americans practice land-based religions. The land they inhabit is a part of their creation stories. It's not that the land belongs to them, it's that they belong to the land, and both are in a symbiotic relationship with one another. History is embedded in the landscape. A person is reminded of specific lessons and wisdom when they see a part of the land. The mouth of this river has a story attached to it. The fallen tree has a story attached to it. A battle was won here. A chief died here. Peace was made between tribes with a feast here. When a native group is forced out of its homeland, the people lose their history. What's worse, they leave behind the places where their dead are buried. Since the dead are bound to that place, the Indians who left no longer have spiritual connections to their ancestors and thus to their gods. The medicine and magic no longer work. They forget the names of sacred places. As the names and history and wisdom are forgotten, the tribe's spiritual power evaporates. Tiway said that when Pike's Peak was taken, 
a group of disgruntled Utes descended on the miners and slaughtered a bunch of them. Because of a complex network of alliances and peace treaties, these Utes were punished by another tribe. They dug holes in the ground and slit the Utes' throats. Then they buried them upside down in the holes with their legs sticking out of the ground so that the wolves would feast on their calves. That was supposed to be the end of it. But then something happened. The legend says that these dead Utes arose from the tainted ground one night. Because their flesh had been flayed from the hips down, they looked like walking skeletons. They hobbled into the Arapaho camps and took women and children back up to the mountain. They forced them deep into one of the mines, never to leave again. The howls of women and children have been reported on the mountain for over a hundred years now. The Utes and Arapaho engaged in blood feuds, sometimes called mourning wars, for years over this. They exchanged curses, executed and skinned and tortured each other. They stained the once sacred earth of Pike's Peak with rivers of blood. I was pretty mortified by this story. I just kind of sat there with the ranger while Tiway and Nathan blessed the cabin. They burned sage and tobacco inside and outside, and used crushed herb to cover their hands. They made a handprint on every window, and drew small symbols and ash at the top of the front door, inside and outside. They gave me bundled sage, cedar, and hawthorn, and told me to burn it if anyone tried to get inside. It drives bad spirits insane. Then, they provided me with small pouches filled with herbs and blessed objects to wear around my neck and in my pockets whenever I went outside. Nathan gave me a totem that he wears around his neck and told me to give it to Faye. Then, they sang a really incredible chant in their language. It lasted about 15 minutes. I was blown away. I fucking love these guys. Then, we went outside. I showed them the Dreamcatcher, and they told me that they'd never seen anything like it. The Dreamcatcher is made with three branches woven together with hair and it has old yarn or wool string with glass beads crisscrossing the center in a pattern. It is old and handmade. Tiway told me not to touch or move it. If you find an object of power and do not know who made it or what it protects, you should leave it alone. I asked him if it could be evil, and he said, Maybe. I got them up to speed on everything that has happened. I said that a lot of my friends, Redditors, but I didn't explain that, suspected that the Fae at my house in California was a duplicate and that the real Fay was somewhere in the woods. Tiway and Nathan disagreed with each other on whether that could be, but we searched the woods looking for signs of my Fay. We found nothing. I told them about the missing ring, and they said exactly what many Redditors have said. If Fay loved the ring, and it was powerfully symbolic to her, it could be used by a bad spirit to harm her. They told me to find it at all costs. They also told me that if Fay indeed were still here on the mountain, she was certainly dead. And the moment we've all been waiting for. Tiway named the creature that was tormenting us. He said his people called it Atan Eanotogakua, the imposter. Bad spirits inhabit the land everywhere, and sometimes they get the opportunity to use a tragedy like the Pike's Peak Massacre to commandeer a human figure and walk the earth partly mortal. In the case of the imposter, they collect animal and human parts piecemeal wherever they can and stitch them together. This is why they walk strangely, vocalize strangely, and why they never show their face or come out during the day. They cannot pass for humans. I asked Tiway why I always see someone facing away from me at the edge of the forest. He said it's because it does not want me to know its identity. But eventually, the imposter would come for me, wearing face skin, teeth, and hair, and tried to convince me that it was her. When I asked him what it wanted, he said, nobody knows. He also told me that there is power in names, as many Redditors have stated, and that I should not speak its name, especially not to it, because that could provoke it. Of the voices I was hearing in the forest every night, Tiwe said, they practice what they hear for decades. It makes it easier for them to hunt. The freaky shit. Tiwe and Nathan and the ranger left at sunset, and I spent the rest of the evening thinking about all of this and I think I figured a lot of things out. Around 9 p.m., something disturbing happened. I used the satellite phone the ranger gave me to call Faye. She actually answered and was just lying in bed reading. We had a great conversation. I told her I missed her so much and that I was up here trying to solve what was happening. I told her I wanted to have a family with her and had actually gone a whole night without sleepwalking or terrifying Jason and Richard. After about 15 minutes of talking, I started hearing sounds outside. I heard footsteps crunching in the dry snow, and I heard a voice. My voice. It said things like, Flight. Insomnia. Miss you. 
See you soon. The thing had been standing near the window, mimicking my conversation with Faye. I told Faye I'd call her back later and hung up the phone, then went silent. The thing walked around the cabin slowly, trying to figure out if I had moved, and kept mumbling and repeating a few phrases as it went. Finally, it came and knocked on the door. Its knock was gentle, just like last night. I was a bit less scared because of all the blessings t had put on the cabin, but I still held onto the gun just in case any shit went down. He spoke to me in my own voice, and the first thing he said was, The hole will fill with snow and blood. So yeah, that amped up my fear quite a bit. Every hair on the back of my neck bristled. Do you know the feeling of being so scared that your vision turns hyper real? Everything looks like a realistic video game, so everything looks slightly off. <laughs> then it knocked again and said, Hello? May I come in? I simply said, No. Leave. Then it knocked for another 30 seconds or so and said, What is your name? Hello? I lied and said, My name is David. Now leave. You can't come in. The thing started knocking harder, a lot harder, nonstop, and said, What is your name? 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 It was terrifying to hear my voice coming from the other side of the door and to hear rage building in that voice. I said again, My name is Daniel! But the thing just kept yammering and asking the same question. It would occasionally say things like, Ticket. Ticket. Rental car. You go up in the trees. The hole. The hole. Down in the hole. What is your name? May I know your name? Then I had an idea. I'm really good with fake accents, and when I was a child, my first language was German. Dad immigrated to Boston and met my mom. I started speaking in a thick accent, and talking about my day, and then started shouting in German. I recited a poem I know by Hermann Hesse, De Fron von Vervene Tragen. My visitor went silent and stopped knocking. I could tell it was just listening, so I started shouting in a British accent, reciting lines from V for Vendetta, my favorite film of all time. I shouted thank you in every single language I know. I once committed to learning it in 100 languages and stopped like around 20. My unwanted guest just sort of stammered a little bit, trying to mimic me, but failed to do so. I was no longer speaking in any recognizable pattern or tone. Eventually, it just started growling the sounds Faye and I heard in the forest when we first stayed at the cabin. Watch you, watch you, wool, my, wool, my started scratching and pounding on the door. I grabbed the sage bundle and torched it with my lighter, then waved it around the door frame. I don't know if the thing outside could smell it, but it walked off the porch, all pissed off, growling, and went off into the night. This time, I ran to the window and tried to get a glimpse of it, but all I could see was a very dark, amorphous form disappearing into the trees. I think I've figured a lot of stuff out. I think this entity is mimicking me because it's going to try to convince Faye that it is me. It is rehearsing my voice and then whispering to Faye while she sleeps, talking to her in her dreams, trying to get her to let it inside our house. I think it wants to convince her that I am the imposter, not it. I think I also figured out why the voices go crazy at night and why they're getting closer to my home. These fuckers aren't trying to scare me, they're trying to deprive me of sleep. If I'm psychologically and emotionally drained, I'm weaker. If I'm delirious, I'll make a mistake. Their or his attempts to get to me will be easier. I'm still trying to figure out how controlling Faye like a puppet in her sleep plays into all of this. I know what I saw. There was a man standing outside of our house, walking the exact same creepy way Faye was sleepwalking at the exact same time. I'm also considering the possibility that I already made a terrible mistake, and that the imposter has already won. When I went outside on the first night at the cabin with Faye, trying to see where the voices were coming from, I left the door unlocked. One of the Redditors said that that was the moment that Faye was replaced by something else. I, I just don't know what to think. But for now, I'm going the fuck to sleep. Update. 4.30. Well, I found the ring. Update. 5.2. I'm out of the cabin and safe. Do not go to Pike's Peak looking to be a hero, looking to find the mines, or looking for me. You will die. Avalanches, radon gas, mine collapses, etc. Do not be a fool. The morning after I spoke with my fiance Faye on the satellite phone, and then was visited by the thing that mimics our voices, I got a call from Richard and Jason. 
Richard stays up very late and sleeps in the morning, kind of like what I'm doing. He does this for two reasons, to work on his art commissions and to make sure Faye doesn't stab everyone to death and burn down the house in her sleep. The guys report that she is behaving quite normally and feeling good, being productive during the day. But then at night, she is unpredictable and weird. I feel like her soul is being cleaved in half. The two distant sets of behavior are drifting further from each other every day. Around 1 a.m. that night, Richard heard the voice of a young child, mumbling incoherently. He's up to speed on all of the unusual experiences that have plagued my fiancé and me, so he immediately got up to investigate. He looked out the kitchen window, which faces the same part of the forest where I saw the man mimicking Faye's sleepwalking movements. Richard didn't find anything, so he walked in a circle around the house and realized that the sound was coming from our bedroom window. He went inside and woke Jason up, and they stood outside the bedroom door listening. They claimed they heard the distinct sound of child whispering and softly singing, and I bet you can guess which song. Both of these dudes are super ripped climbing enthusiasts, and they said that they've never been so creeped out in their entire lives. Jason knocked on the door and said, Faye, who's in there? And he promptly heard the child go, and whisper something inaudibly. Richard pushed the door open and said that Faye was standing in the corner of the room in the dark, facing the wall. She was standing up on her toes, dragging her hands and nails down the wall and talking to herself. With her back turned to the guys, she said, Oh, their skin is so perfect. Which one? Which one? Put him down in the hole. Richard saw something out the window and hurried over to it. Jason stepped inside the room and reached out to put a hand on Faye's shoulder, but she whirled around quickly and covered her face with her hands. Her eyes were open, which is unusual for her when she sleepwalks. Then, and these are the exact words Jason used, she started speaking in the voice of a little kid. She made whining and crying sounds and rocked back and forth on her feet, cradling her arms as though she held a child. Then she turned around and started scratching at the wall again, still whispering in the kid's voice, saying things like, It's Faye. I can't see you. Are you up in the trees or down in the hole? Then she started singing again. Richard ran down the stairs and out the front door, barreling toward the tree line. From the window, he had seen a small child walking around on its tippy toes, flailing its arms up in the air. On the phone, he told me that he could hear it singing while he watched it from the window. When Richard got about 20 yards from the kid, it took off running on the balls of its feet, heading straight into the woods. Richard stayed in pursuit and went in after it. It was too dark for him to follow, and he lost the kid after a few moments. He wandered around for a few minutes, searching the area, and eventually heard the voice of an adult male. Richard said he walked a few steps deeper into the grove and saw a huge man standing about 30 feet away, completely naked, looking up into the trees. There were lacerations or dark pock marks of some sort all over his body. Now, Richard is about 6'1", 210 pounds, and bulky or muscular. He said that this dude was way bigger than him. He said that the man was perfectly still for several seconds, but then started rolling his head around, cracking his neck loudly, and started making gurgling and mumbling sounds. I guess Richard was paralyzed with fear because he claims he stood there for an entire minute or more before running like hell back to the house. As he turned to get out of there, the man let out a long hello, and as he did, his voice transformed. It became my voice. Richard said that the thing in the woods called out with my voice several times as he fled, wailing, please help me, and they're going to kill me tonight. Jason says that he did not hear or see anything out of the window, only Richard running back inside, ghost white with terror. He said Richard actually cried. While they talked in the living room, Faye sat at the top of the stairs, just watching, wide awake with a little smile on her face. The next morning, they took her to our psychiatric appointment, the first she's ever had, and I will hopefully hear back on that soon. It kills me that I'm not there with her now. I'm still stuck at Pike's Peak. It's like this place doesn't want me to leave. The ranger station shut down the entire road network on the mountain because of the huge blizzard that rolled in, and their avalanche warnings. My road out of here is completely iced over, and one part of it has a snow collapse or mini avalanche. Shut up, I'm from California where God pays attention. I'm in contact with the ranger. His name is Greg, just like Faye's dad, so that's why I avoid referring to him by name in these updates. And he assures me that they're working on getting the roads cleared every time it stops snowing. I missed my flight, but thankfully they gave me a voucher, so now I can just roll into the airport whenever I can. I have enough food to feed an army, and the electricity here is surprisingly reliable, so I'm warm. 
The Wi-Fi dips out for 5 or 10 hours at a time, though. Eh, I'm working on Donkey Kong Country 2 and Secret of Mana on the SNES while recording about my experiences here in my spare time. Oh, I also slipped on the icy porch steps and fell on my side, so I got this enormous bruise and it hurts like a bitch, but only when I breathe, so and I got that going for me. The user asked me if the cabin had a basement. I had never thought to check. Outside, under the snowpack and halfway covered with old chipped wood, I found a little locked door. The key was in the kitchen cupboard, and it turns out there is a decent-sized cellar under the house. Downside, I found a ton of creepy shit. There's a bundle of long black hair, several dozen jars of some rotten, mutant-looking shit, and tons of old books from the 60s and 70s, and a lot of porno magazines. There's also a lot of sticks and yarn, all of the material necessary to make a dream catcher like the one hanging at the tree line behind the cabin. I didn't touch anything, I just noped straight out of there. I've been thinking about something one of the users said to me the other day, which was, have you considered that it is not a dream catcher at all? And he's right. I'm not an expert on Native American symbology or artifacts, it just kind of looks like a dream catcher to me, so I've been calling it one all this time. Tiwe, the Pueblo friend of the ranger, didn't call it that. He just said to leave it alone. I'm wondering if that thing attracts the imposter instead of keeping it away. It could mark the house. I kind of want to move it for one night to see what happens. After all, Tiwe blessed the entire cabin, so I feel quite safe, and I have the 357 Magnum in case leaves don't protect me. It's about 9.30 a.m., and there was a knock on the door. I grabbed the gun, suspecting another encounter with the imposter. It's slightly snowing and gloomy, so I figured the sun was blocked enough that the creature would be willing to come out of the woods. But then I heard familiar voices, talking cheerfully. I looked out the window, and to my surprise, it was Tiwe and his son Nathan. It was Tiwe and his son Nathan. These badass motherfuckers just hiked up from the ranger station in the snow to check on me. I let them in, and they made me tea. I cannot tell you how happy I was to see them. Tiwe brought me his own dream catcher. It was one that he made specifically for me and he told me that I should hang it beside the creepy one. It's very colorful and ornate. I could tell he spent a lot of time on it. It's even got two beautiful hawk feathers dangling off of it, which Nathan says represents freedom and unboundedness. He reiterated the importance of finding the engagement ring Faye had lost, and blessed the house again. I tried to get them to stay longer, but they had to get down the mountain before the storm picked up. They told me I should come with them. We all knew I wouldn't. If I left with them, I'd be leaving Greg's truck, and I'd never have found what I came back for. I said goodbye, and t -way hugged me. <laughs> I wish that guy was my grandpa. I took a nap after they left. I figured out how to sleep without being interrupted by the goddamn voices in the forest. From 6am to 3pm, it's pretty quiet outside, so I nap on and off, but something really bad happened this time. I woke up, opening the bathroom window. I've never sleepwalked before in my entire life. Faye's been sleeping next to me for five years, and she says I don't move, I don't speak, I don't snore, I don't steal the sheets, I'm the most polite bed buddy on earth. But when I came to, I was standing next to the toilet, both hands prying the frozen window open. It was about two inches up, and the freezing cold wind on my fingers is what woke me up. I slammed it shut and checked all the windows, ensuring that they were locked and sealed tight. Then I went back to bed. I dragged one of the living room chairs into the bedroom with me and propped it up against the door so that I'd knock it over if I got up again. This did not work. Around 1am, I woke up standing at the front door. I found myself pulling it open. The loud groans it issued were what snapped me out of my stupor. I slammed the door shut and looked out the window next to it, praying nothing was out there waiting for me at the tree line. I saw nothing. Then I remembered I'd had a dream. Images of a huge hole carved into the mountain surfaced in my mind. Snow and branches were caked all around the mouth of the entrance, and an impossible yawning blackness emanated from within. In my dream, I just kind of stood there, gazing into the vacant face of the deep, listening to Faye's weakened cries. I sat down on the couch and just sort of cried for about an hour. I thought about what our lives had become, and how bad I missed her. I thought about all of the dreams we had of our future, the things that can never be if I don't figure out how to save her. I thought about all the promises I'll never keep if I die up here. I decided that it would be best to hang the dream catcher sooner rather than later, because the clouds broke for a while and it was fantastically bright outside. I got geared up and trudged across the snow with Tiwe's gift and hung it on a branch about three feet away from the evil-looking one. And that's when I saw it. Faye's engagement ring. 
It was dangling there, right in front of me, as if to tease me. Someone had woven it into the strings of the Dreamcatcher. I stood there for a long time, right between the two objects. I couldn't figure out if some benevolent force was giving me a break or if I was being taunted by whatever beings have haunted my footsteps ever since I arrived on the mountain. Retrieving the ring would require me to not only touch, but destroy the creepy Dreamcatcher. I had the thought to go and ask you guys what I should do, but I feared that if I left even for one second the ring would be gone when I got back, so I tried to solve the riddle by myself. I wish I'd brought the satellite phone out there with me. After a few minutes of standing there, I reasoned that T-Way's Dreamcatcher would probably do just as well in protecting me, if in fact that was the function of the original one. I also figured that if it were cursed or something, touching it couldn't actually be worse than leaving the ring there and allowing Faye to be completely consumed by her madness. If the ring has anything to do with the creatures who are controlling Faye and me while we sleep, then getting it back is a priority over not touching weird stuff in the woods. So that's what I did. I broke the brittle thing apart and took the goddamn ring back. What else could I have done? And if, as on cue, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was a person standing in the snow beside a tree, about twenty feet from my left side. I was so scared I didn't look directly at him, I just watched him in my periphery and prayed that he hadn't noticed me. It was a man with black and grey hair and dark clothes facing away from me. His head was tilted all the way back. He was looking way up at the top of the trees. His limbs looked mangled and bent and elongated, even without looking right at him. I slid the ring into my pocket as slowly as I could, trying not to make a sound. And as I did, the man hobbled around and faced me. I really didn't want to look now. I just slammed my eyes shut. I knew he was looking at me. I could feel his gaze on me. He started gurgling and making throaty sounds, and then said in a voice so threatening I can't even begin to describe, Felix, I know you. Felix, I know you. Felix, I know you. Over and over, I took off running and screaming like a bat out of hell. I screamed all the way back to the fucking cabin. I barricaded the front door with the couch and burned up half the stage I had left. I even prayed, like, like an actual prayer. I hadn't done that since I was 15 years old. I'm really struggling with recording this last part. It's taken me hours to finish this entry because I keep getting up to distract myself. The ranger isn't answering his phone. Nobody's at the station. Maybe the power's out. I don't know what I did by breaking that dream catcher, and I don't know what tonight is going to be like, but Faye, if you ever hear this, and if something happens to me, <laughs> don't forget your tenderness, your, your, your softened skin. All I needed, your love is my tourniquet. I have to say this even though I desperately want it to not be true. The man I saw was T-Way. Things have spiraled out of control up here on the mountain. I made a decision that changed everything and it almost killed me. Only time will tell if it was the right choice to make, but for now, I'm just piecing everything together in my mind and trying to convince myself that I'm one step closer to solving all of this. I destroyed the strange dreamcatcher that had been dangling on a tree branch behind the cabin since Faye and I first came to this place. Nobody knows who made it, what its purpose is, or why it was on the side of the tree facing into the woods, rather than the side facing the house. I found all of the supplies to make another one just like it, locked behind a cellar door that someone tried to hide years ago. But when I broke the Dreamcatcher, I learned everything I needed to know. T-Way is dead. A lot of people have said otherwise, but I'm certain of this. I saw his likeness stretched over the gruesome form of the thing that stalks these woods. It was broad daylight, and the look on its mangled face told me exactly what I didn't want to accept. I really am all alone. Several Redditors have speculated that this thing only shows itself at night and always faces away from me because it cannot convincingly appear human, not without the help of the recently dead. Tiwe confirmed this during his first visit to the cabin, but when I destroyed that dreamcatcher, there it was, proudly masquerading in the skin and hair of my best friend on this mountain. In the sunlight, no less. I cannot even imagine how his son Nathan must feel, if he's even alive. 
The two hiked back to the ranger station from the cabin, knowing a blizzard was coming. I'm sure that's when Tiwe died. When I got back inside the cabin, I completely lost it. I barricaded the door and the windows with every piece of furniture I could, but there just isn't enough stuff inside the cabin to protect me. So I sat there on the floor against the bed, clutching the gun, sort of wishing my dark visitor would come and kill me already. But of course, this is Pike's Peak. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you here. So the mountain kept fucking with me. It was getting dark, and I was on the verge of a total psychological break. I've been running on four hours of sleep per night and a few naps for the past two weeks. My only hope for redemption just got turned into a puppet, and I was about to find out what happens come nightfall when the dream catcher no longer functions. So what did my brain decide was the best course of action at this point? To fall asleep. I somehow nodded off. In fact, I think my brain just did a hard reset because nothing about that sleep was restful. I just went into a fear coma the minute the sun dipped behind the mountain. And then I woke up. I was in bed with the sheets pulled up over me. The lights were off, all of them, and my hands were empty, when before they held Greg's 357 Magnum. When I opened my eyes, I supposed it was possible that I'd climbed into bed myself. After all, I'd caught myself sleepwalking twice the day before, but it took me a solid minute before I realized there was a fucking arm wrapped around my chest. I did not have the reaction you'd expect. Most people would fly out of bed screaming bloody murder, but the first thought I had was, where am I? My parents divorced when I was three, so as a kid I'd spend a few nights a week at my dad's house and a few nights at my mom's. Sometimes I'd wake up in the dark and not be sure which bedroom I was in, it always took me a second to remember where I was. This is the thought that crossed my delirious mind. Maybe I was back at home in California. Maybe I was at Faye's parents' house in Arvada. I sort of rolled out from under the arm and tried to figure out who the hell I was lying in bed with. I'd been sleeping with the lights on for the past few nights, and I'd never in my right mind have turned them off after seeing the creature so close to me a few hours ago. The body in bed beside me felt familiar. Its warmth, its texture... I was pretty sure it was Faye, but I still couldn't remember if she was really with me up here. Then she spoke. She reached through the dark and touched my face and said, What's wrong, Pop-Tart? Yeah, that's actually the nickname she gave me. Love me some s'mores Pop-Tarts. I wasn't really afraid. I just overwhelmed with confusion. I asked her where we were and why the lights were off. She just squeezed my shoulder and said, Honey, we're in Pike's Peak. There's a storm. The power's gone out. It's done this before. What's wrong with you? I got up out of bed. A feeling of dread was falling over me, heavier and heavier, the more awake I became. As soon as the sheets were off of me, I felt a blistering cold, colder than it's ever been in the cabin. The heat must have been off for hours. Only a bit of pale moonlight filtered in through the windows, and it was barely enough to outline the objects in the room. I stumbled around, looking for the flashlight, totally unable to remember where it was, and said, Why the fuck is it so cold? Did you screw with the heat? Faye tried to get me to come back to bed. She told me that it went off and came back on earlier, that it would probably be back on soon. Everything about her felt wrong. Her voice was perfectly clear. Her skin felt totally recognizable. I couldn't shake the strange feeling I had. I left the bedroom and walked out into the living room. It was even colder out there. I felt my way around with my hands and noticed a strong, icy draft coming from down the hall. It's a straight shot from the living room to the bathroom at the other end of the hall, and from where I stood, I could see the bathroom window. It was open. A big two-by-two-foot gap leading out into the snow. I went to shout, Why the fuck did you- But Faye stepped out of the bedroom and stood in the hallway between me and the bathroom. She said something like, Felix, you aren't feeling well. Do you not remember what's going on? You're sick. I almost believed her because I definitely felt dizzy and feverish, but it could also have been a mixture of disturbed confusion and freezing cold. The thought that this was not really Faye invaded my mind, and I immediately regretted not knowing where the gun was. The only words I could find were, Who are you? And, Why are you here? Faye just stood there in the darkness of the hallway. The only thing I could see was a little sliver outline of her figure. Her face was entirely black. But even though her eyes were hidden, I could feel them burning into me, just as Tiwe's had when I found the ring. It felt like we stood in the eye of a hurricane. Everything was totally calm, but I knew hell was about to break loose. There wasn't a single sound outside. 
No branches snapped, no sound crunched, no voices moaned. It was as if time had stopped completely. Faye didn't move. Even as she spoke, she held herself with the stillness of death. She said, Felix. It wasn't going to get my attention. It wasn't going to convince me that she was really my fiancé. It was a threat. She was reminding me that she knew my name. I still don't fully understand what the power is in names, but Tiway and Nathan believed it, and many Redditors warned me about it. When she said my name, I felt smaller than her, even though I stand almost a foot over her head. Do you remember the five? She still didn't move an inch. Not even her hair kicked up in the drafts that blew in from behind her. I can't remember. Not in this place. I didn't know how to respond to this. I didn't know what she was talking about. All I could say was, get out. You're not welcome here. Again, Faye didn't move, but she did clear her throat, and the sound she made was about two octaves deeper than the real Faye's voice. She inhaled sharply and said, <coughs> Tell me about the number five. And that's when I knew. I remembered where I was, what day it was, and exactly what had happened up until this point. My visitor had finally come to call, and no longer needed to be invited. I deeply regretted breaking that dream catcher. My hands instinctively slid over my pockets, and to my relief, the little shape of Faye's engagement ring pushed back against my fingers. There was nothing else to do. I decided to throw down the gauntlet. I figured it was probably time to die anyways, so I might as well go out bravely. I said, I know who you are, and you will never be Faye. She took a menacing step toward me. A gurgle seeped out of her throat. She inhaled again, more slowly this time, and demanded, I want to know about the number five. Tell me, Felix. I looked all around me on the counters for a weapon, but found nothing. The knife block was on the other side of the short wall that divided the living room from the kitchen. There was only one roll of paper towels within reach, but in retrospect, I was so amped with terror that I probably could have beaten her ass to death with it. I don't have a clue what that number means, I said. In fact, about 5,000 people online don't either. Nobody knows. Only Faith knows. My visitor started shaking with rage. Her face was wreathed with impossible black. There was an endless abyss in it that stung my eyes. But then I realized something. This creature, whatever it is, has had access to Faye's mind for several hours every night. Maybe for many years. Maybe even since she first visited the cabin when she was five years old. And in all that time, it still hadn't learned anything about her. It could never perfectly imitate her because she kept some things buried so deep in her subconscious that not even this thing could find them. Whatever the number five meant to Faye, that deep place is where she kept the secret. She didn't even go there in her dreams. The next part was all a blur. I said something like, You are the one who speaks to her in her sleep. The visitor kind of nodded. I said, You ask her things. She answers you. I hear everything she says. The visitor didn't react. Then I said, You've asked her this question, just like you're asking me now, and she always says, No, no, I can't tell you. My visitor took another step forward, dragging a hand along the wall, as Faye had so many times in her sleepwalking fits. It raised up on the balls of its feet and twitched violently. It said to me, I will make you tell me. It didn't try to mimic my fiancé's voice anymore. It sucked in huge breaths, trying to control its rage. There is a certain feeling you get when you're about to die. When you're in danger and you might die, fear completely overwhelms your senses and compels you to flee, to fight, to save yourself, somehow. But past that point, when you know you're going to die, that fear becomes useless and disappears. This has happened to me only once before. When I was sucked into a riptide at the beach during an El Nino winter as a teenager, in that moment I just wondered, will my body ever come back to shore? Will they ever know what happened to me? In this moment, my heart slowed down, and I didn't feel cold anymore. I just stood there, ready to be mauled by death. I was satisfied in the knowledge that I had not given this creature what it wanted, and therefore blocked it from using the knowledge as a weapon against Fay. Whatever five meant, this thing needed it to take full possession of my fiancé, and I wasn't going to let that happen. I laughed. I actually laughed and said, Well, you're shit out of luck, buddy, because I don't know what the hell it means. Maybe you can tell me when you figure it out. The imposter laughed right back in my voice, a perfect mimicry, and it said, Well, then I don't need you anymore. It lunged at me, 
Now, I've dodged a rabid German Shepherd like I was a ninja, but this thing was so fast and so strong that it knocked the wind clean out of me. I toppled backwards and crash landed on my shoulder on the tiles near the front door. It unleashed a barrage of blows on my face and neck. It raked my sweatshirt with razor blade like claws. I tried my best to defend myself, but it was so dark in the house that I couldn't see almost anything. I managed to flail my way free of its grasp for just a second. I pulled myself up to my feet by grabbing the counter, and in doing so, my hand brushed against the little bundle of sage I'd been burning. The imposter was on me like lightning, grabbing me by the back of my neck and pulling me with the strength of a 250 pound man. I very ingloriously wheeled around and smashed the sage bundle into the creature's face, burnt end first, and wrapped my other arm around its head, Phase familiar locks tangled in my fingers. I pulled its head forward and jammed the brittle sage into its eyes as hard as I could, screaming like a banshee. It shrieked and growled in some inhuman language and tried to push me away, but I held on as hard as I could and kept driving my fingers into its eyes, crushing the twigs into them. The memory of Nathan and Tiwei's chant surfaced in my mind and I shouted the only part I could pronounce. Teneke Aden! Teneke Aden! Teneke Aden! My hand slipped over its face and the mockery of Faye's appearance fell away. I couldn't see it in the dark, but the face no longer resembled my fiancé's. The mouth was much too big for a human's, and the wet lips draped across the maw of a hundred fangs. And that was it. The bastard had enough. It screamed and growled and took off on all fours, its limbs elongated as it moved farther from me, its shape becoming recognizably inhuman even in the pale light. It barreled up the bathroom wall and out of the window, and in moments, it was completely gone. I definitely am not afraid to cry. I do it at funerals, at weddings, during the Hunchback of Notre Dame, but I'm a little embarrassed to admit how long and hard I cried after that creature left the cabin. I never felt so utterly, miserably alone in my entire life. I only stopped when the power came back on, which was probably 20 minutes later. The heater kicked on instantly and I ran over to shut and lock the bathroom window. My satellite phone was gone, the gun was gone probably outside in the snow or up in a tree or down in the hole. I peeked out the kitchen window and saw something lying on the porch, right near the front door. When I cracked the door open just for a second, I saw that it was Tiwei's dream catcher. It had been destroyed and placed in front of the cabin, mocking me, or reminding me that I was unprotected. I checked the timer on the little bakery clock in the kitchen and it read 12.15 a.m. I was going to have to spend another night in this godforsaken cabin, but I vowed myself that at daybreak, no matter the conditions, I would take Greg's truck and get down the mountain, or die trying. I didn't care if I slid off the cliff face, I'd never watch the sun go down in Colorado ever again. For a while, I actually considered leaving right then, in the middle of the night. Many Redditors have reprimanded me for not doing this before, but I assure you, even in this situation, driving in the dark on that icy little road next to the 400-foot cliff is a complete nope situation. But the mountain had other plans for me. At one point, I risked sneaking outside to determine how deep the truck was buried, but as I approached, I saw that the snow had been dug out around the front tires, and they'd been slashed to ribbons. All I could do was let out a grim laugh and trudge back inside. At least it was warm in there now. At around 1 a.m., the voices started up. They arose from far off in the woods, several of them at once, groaning and screaming dark elegies to the night. It was all the same evil gibberish I'd heard a thousand times before, but they slowly made their way into the open field, and eventually to just outside the cabin. I lit the remaining pieces of sage and did a once-over on all the windows that weren't barricaded with furniture. I also donned the medicine pouches and amulet that Tiwe and Nathan had given to me hoping that they'd be similarly effective in protecting me. Then I remembered Tiwei's useless dream catcher, and imagined my crumpled corpse lying in the snow beside it. Outside the front door, I distinctly heard my own voice calling. Faye? Faye, it's me. Felix, let me in. Let me in. And from near the bathroom window, my voice again, saying, Hey, sweetie. I miss you so much. It repeated a few other things I've said on the phone in conversation with her and even a few things I said to her while she was sleepwalking back at our home in California. There were footsteps on the roof, two and maybe three pairs of little feet stomping all over the ceiling, voices of crying children paired with them. I stood there in the kitchen, clutching a knife and the herbs, waiting for the end. The voices circled the cabin, as though a handful of deranged lunatics were slowly marching around the perimeter, singing the songs of hell as they went. They begged for help, they laughed maniacally, they whispered and screamed and talked entirely to themselves, all at once. Their dim shadows passed the window curtains over and over. 
I heard glass breaking in the bedroom and then in the bathroom. The stomping on the roof grew louder and the voices of the front door grew more urgent. Someone began knocking on the door and the others tapped on the living room windows and they all started screaming. Hey, hey, let us in. And Felix, are you there? And then, as if heaven sent, a blinding white light illuminated the entire cabin from outside. All of the window curtains at the front of the house lit up, and the sound of motors drowned out the hellish cries. Someone had driven up to the cabin. I heard doors opening and men calling out coherently. The footsteps on the roof thundered overhead to the back of the cabin, and the screams of children drifted off into the woods out back, echoing as they withdrew. The ranger bashed on the front door, calling out my full name, instructing me to come outside. I looked out the window and saw five men, some in uniforms, and the ranger. There was a humongous off-road snowplow, two snowmobiles, and a big truck, and they'd come to save my life. When I went outside, I just walked up and hugged the ranger. I didn't even grab my winter jacket. He informed me that they were getting everyone off of the mountain because of a problem with the power grid. He said he'd feared I'd freeze to death. The ride down the mountain would have been the happiest ride of my life, except for the view. We snaked across slippery white roads, and even with the truck's high beams on, I could see the brightest stars I've ever witnessed. But beneath them, dangling in the trees, were dozens and dozens of human bodies. They swung by rope from their feet or necks. Some of them were flayed or missing parts. The ranger didn't appear to notice, and I kept my mouth shut. As they passed overhead on our downward crawl, I could almost make out their frozen faces, lifeless for years, maybe decades. Their black blood stained the trunks of the trees. I'm not sure if these were the spirits Tiwe talked about, or if I had simply been experiencing temporary insanity. I'm not sure I'll ever know who they were, but I'm guessing that if the ranger showed up any later, I would have become one of them. I will never forget the haunting image of passing underneath them. We arrived at the ranger station and remained there overnight. I slept in a cot in a room of about 15 people, all locals from different places on the mountain. I asked the ranger if he'd heard from Tiwe or Nathan, but he said he had not. The next morning, one of his men drove me straight to Denver International Airport, and I boarded a plane without any luggage whatsoever. It didn't matter. I had the ring in my pocket, and I'll never need a jacket again as long as I live. When I finally got home, Faye let me have it. She kept kissing and yelling at me. I understood. She was angry that I'd spent so much time trying to take control of this situation, treating her like a child and disregarding her feelings in my crusade to rescue her. She was upset that I consigned her to the care of my best friends without asking, but seemed to appreciate their help. Richard and Jason were very happy to leave my house and never look Faye in the eye again, although they did have some good news for me. Faye had not sleepwalked or slept-talked or done anything out of the ordinary in over 24 hours. This corresponds almost exactly with when I retrieved the ring from the Dreamcatcher. After an hour or so of reprimanding me for being a thick-headed idiot, Faye forgave me, and we laid together in bed and talked about everything. I apologized for her for the way that I had treated her and put the ring on her finger. She looked relieved to have it back on. I swore I'd never screw up like that again. We both slept a full night. No strange night terrors or bad dreams or sleep disturbances of any kind, and in the morning, Yesterday morning, we had Faye's favorite, waffles. At about 11 a.m., I received a call. To my great relief, it was Nathan. I immediately pressed him for information about Tiwe and what exactly had happened after they left the cabin that day. He ignored my questions and said very ominously, Please let me speak to the one who followed you home. I said something like, Uh, what? To which he replied, The one that calls itself Faye. My fiancé and I had been sitting on the couch watching the most recent Game of Thrones, so I just sort of handed the phone to her and said, It's for you. She put it to her ear and said hello, and then listened for about a minute. I could hear Nathan speaking, but I could not make out what he was saying. Suddenly, a volcano of black puke exploded from Faye's mouth. It absolutely covered the couch and carpet, and sent me nearly jumping out of my skin in the process. Faye doubled over onto the floor like a ragdoll, coughing and sputtering. I fell to my knees beside her, panicked, and asking if she was alright. I picked up the phone and screamed at Nathan, demanding to know what he had said to her. Nathan just said, Please, Felix, please listen. And then proceeded to recite some sort of chant or incantation. A wave of syrupy vomit rushed up my throat and out of my mouth. And as with Faye, it was oily black. I'm actually an emetophobe, so vomiting sends me into a state of near catatonia. 
but Faye made a quick recovery and was right there to nurse me back to my senses. Nathan spoke to me a bit more and explained what he had done. I'll get to that in a bit. Faye and I spent the rest of the day feeling queasy and eventually went to urgent care across the road to get checked out. They gave us blood tests and checked our vitals and sent us home, telling us that we'd suffered minor food poisoning. But I know deep down it wasn't the damn waffles. Thankfully, for the past several hours, we've been feeling much better. I mentioned a while back that Tiwe and Nathan had a disagreement over who the real Faye was and whether it was even possible for a duplicate of my fiancé to exist. When they hiked back down the mountain from the cabin a few days ago, they had to go up into the forest to avoid a snow collapse all over the road. Out there in the woods, they heard the crying of a woman and followed it to an abandoned mine. Both of them knew that it was very likely a trick, but Tiwe said that it was their duty to explore the possibility that Faye was alive somewhere on the mountain. The blizzard came on earlier than expected, and they stood at the mouth of the mine, listening to the begging of the young woman somewhere off in the dark, but concluded that its voice was too unusual to be humans. Tiwe and Nathan decided to bless the entrance of the mine, which could ward off its dark inhabitants, but their chanting enraged whatever lived in it. It came out of the tunnels and snatched Tiwe. He screamed all the way down into the dark. Nathan could not follow. He ran away, terrified, but got lost in the blizzard. He wandered for an hour, fearing death, and eventually came upon a skinny body swinging from a low tree branch. It was so fresh the blood hadn't fully frozen. Nathan knew it was his father's corpse. Eventually he found his way back home. He said his father's voice guided him out of the squall. Nathan explained to me that the imposter's goal of taking over someone's mind was different from its penchant for killing people. These creatures hunt and kill at random salvaging the human parts that they need to walk the earth as mortals for a short time, but their real pleasure derives from conquering a person from within. Faye was one of the unlucky few that are chosen in this way, and the imposter's fixation on her had lasted for decades. After long enough, their continued presence in the body and mind of the victim leaves a stain on the soul. This corruption necessitates a purge, hence the barf party we had in the living room, whose stains, by the way, I have thus failed to banish. Nathan invited me to the funeral ceremony for Tiway. I sadly declined, as I'm already on the verge of losing my job and flat broke from this experience, but I promised that I'd honor his memory in my own way. I can't go back to that place. Fortunately, Nathan was more than understanding, and promised we'd meet again soon. I'm still thinking about all of this. I do not yet have all the pieces of the puzzle. If you're looking for all the answers, you're going to have to help me find them, but I think I have part of this figured out. The imposter gave Faye's ring back to me. They wanted me to destroy the Dreamcatcher. The ring was an object of great sentimental value, both to Faye and to our relationship. The creature used it to invade Faye's mind and control her thoughts. Its goal was to convince her that it was me, so that she would welcome it into our house late at night. The home, Nathan said, symbolically represents the body, just as the ring represents our union. To be welcomed into the home is to be granted access to Faye. But because the imposter could never learn everything it needed from Faye to mimic me, it gave up on that project and instead came after me. It returned the ring to me, thus giving up its power over Faye, but I broke the Dreamcatcher to retrieve it. As it turns out, that creepy, mysterious Dreamcatcher was in fact protecting the cabin and everyone inside it, which is why the imposter needed to be invited in. When I broke it, the creature could have easily come in and killed me, but it needed information from me before it did. It needed to know one of Faye's darkest secrets to rule her. I'm not sure I'll ever unravel the mystery of the number five, but I do know one thing. Not knowing what it means actually saved Faye's life. I'm not sure I ever want to know. As for Faye, she's back to normal and in perfect health. She sleeps soundly and only mumbles a bit, which is pretty normal for her. Her sick sense of humor has returned as well. Last night as we went to sleep, she turned the light off and said to me, Thank you for trying so hard. Then she leaned over and licked my face. <laughs>